What we feel today is not felt everywhere. Now, one thing about my prayer when I preach is that I have been called to preach the truth. Amen. Amen. The truth. Amen. Not opinion. It's the truth. People don't believe that there's an absolute truth. Jesus is the absolute truth. He is the way, the truth, and he is the life. And you can't come face to face with truth unless, until you allow Jesus to become the Lord of your life. So many of you have been here many years and maybe you really don't even understand me because I deal in the truth. Amen. Amen. When you know the truth, you're capable of knowing the lie. What is a lie? There's a spirit of error and there's a spirit of truth. And all I want in my life is to not only know the truth, but to live the truth, to speak the truth, and be ready, amen, to meet the truth someday face to face. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading from the book of Philippians today. Chapter number four. And verse number 19. Text today in Jesus' name. Yeah. Philippians 4:19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I want to preach today for a few moments on that my God shall supply. My God shall supply. Lord, we're so blessed to be here right now in this place at this time. And I'm asking that you would anoint my lips, O God, to preach your word. As I open my mouth, that you would fill it. Have someone find a change in their life, repentance, Lord, for we face, we face a very challenging time. Minister to one and all is my prayer. In Jesus' name I ask it. And saying amen, you may be seated. Amen. The portion of scripture that we take, uh, I've taken it, for now, just uh, separate, but I want to place it into its context. I want to place it in a way where, where you can actually claim or understand this benefit coming into your life. You see, this verse of scripture here is, is by itself is not very useful to us. But take it in its understanding or in its context, you'll be able to understand how to fall into this category. It's just like having someone tell you that all you need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household shall be saved. If you hear that, uh, you really cannot, because it's out of the context, you can't really make it benefit your life as to having salvation just with that one verse. Amen. You can't. It won't work. But the only way that it works is understanding the 
the way that the verse is supposed to uh, work. And it always takes the verses with it so you can so you can benefit by the word of God. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Now we are living in we are living in a very unique time. We're living in a time right now where we are what are called the supply chains are beginning to fail throughout the world. And there is less, there are less uh, product coming uh, to us as the days go by because what do they call it? The way that uh, there's something happening in between because of uh, mostly it's government interference, all right? And so because of, of regulations and, and uh, ideas that the government has put in into this world, it is meant simply to control, to have more control over, I would say, mammon or money. Now, this is important for you. This little portion here, I'm going to start out sort of slow, is really important for you to understand because it is like we are getting an understanding what it is to what a depression is going to be like in the near future. We're getting warning signs that there are less product on the store shelves. And slowly it's going to get worse. So I felt the word of God come into my spirit today to tell you that there is a powerful uh, condition that you can meet so that God will supply your need. No, I didn't say your needs, all of them, but... There is a, a very powerful, uh, we serve a very powerful God that will, that will, whatever it is that we have in our makeup that we absolutely need for the purpose of serving him, then he will supply that. Therefore, we are taught that we ought to, that we ought to uh, be content in our attitude ought to be that we ought to be content in the condition that we find ourselves in. We ought to content, be content with what we have today. If your spirit is, you've got to have the new thing. The Lord is telling you, you need to learn to be content with what you have today and not what you could possibly have tomorrow. Amen. Because God will meet that need. He will not meet the need that we are able, thank God we live in an affluent society still, that we can have more than we deserve and more than we need. We are what is called a throwaway society. You can get rid of something. You can get rid of a, a, a good, decent car uh, that's perfectly good and for, because you want a newer model, for instance. That is the way of the American dream. Right. Amen. Is it not? Amen. Yeah, it is. And then that car, the one you turn in, can be sold to somebody that has, can afford a brand new car and so forth. And so to a degree... Uh, there's no cry outcry, but I would need, you need to understand this: that we need, as a people of God, to know how to be content with what we have. Amen. 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 If you would learn to be content with what you have, then your bank, your bank uh, account would be more full. Yeah, it would be. It would be sitting there for when there is a greater need in your life, to use it toward that. Instead, we have learned to live hand to mouth, and we can't even afford to take days off. We can't even afford to take, go to church because we have to work, because uh, our, our wants have overgrown our needs. Outgrown. So therefore, we would rather skip church, and we would rather take jobs that, that come into, into uh, our seventh day, and we actually consider that for a moment how, if we should do or if we should take that job or not. Well, or you should go on that recreation. Whatever it is, listen, you need to put God first for, for this to work for you. For God to begin to supply your need according to your riches, in, according to his riches and glory, you have to put God first. Number one, not you, not your family, God first. 
That's the only, that's the way I learned it from the beginning. That's the way I have lived it. I'm not a hypocrite concerning this. Amen. God first. Praise the Lord. Now, I've never really understood why I just did it naturally because I, I walk in the spirit. But I've never had really thought about it, why it is that it has worked for me in that door has just opened up. And, uh, and God has blessed me. And as a, for the most part, when I first started working, all my jobs always got better as I went along. My previous job was never better than what I have now. No. Amen. It's like, it's like the lady that told him, the preacher, you know, man, you're really something. Your, your last message has always been better than your next one. It's not saying much for a preacher, is it? If my best is behind me. No. The best is always ahead when you're serving God. Yeah. Yeah, I, it will always be, you will have what is called an expected end. You will always have optimism for the future. You'll always understand because the path of the just is as a shining light that shining more and more unto the perfect day. It gets brighter. You get wealthier? No, I said your day gets brighter. Your faith and your walk with God... Uh, you're satisfied, and God satisfies your mouth with good things, uh, and your, your, everything that you do prospers. Right. Now, we're living in that day where you have to have this mindset in your life. Where this scripture is taken up, I'll put it into my own words. Paul, is, I believe, is over near Thessalonica, I believe, and he is... He is a type that he doesn't require anything from anybody. In other words, he says, in whatever condition I find myself in want, if I need something, or in want, or if I have more than enough, I am, I am capable of receiving from God what he gives me for that day. I am content in whatsoever state I find myself in. So if you find yourself in the state of Arizona, be content, all right? Whatever state, he said, I find myself in. If you're from Tennessee, well, I don't, can't talk about that. But, but whatever, no, really, whatever condition I find myself in, I learned to say, you know, God has his hand in this. And he knows that, that even though I might be a little hungrier than I'd like to be, that my God is going to take care of me because I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God is in control. Clap your hands to the Lord. And give him praise because he is about, I believe, to help someone straighten their lives up. Now this is what he was saying. So he made mention. He said, I know how to be a bait and I know how to abound. I know how to be full, how to be hungry. He says, I know how to abound and I know how to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So when he talks about this, if whatever it is you're at, whatever your financial condition is right now, whatever your health condition, whatever your state of mind is, whatever it is, you learn that you're going to get through it. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Whether you're lacking or you're abounding, you learn you learn that your, your life does not consist of the things which you possess. Uh -uh. Your life, your spiritual life does not. So he tells us, don't be coveted. Don't have to have everything that everyone else has or you think they have. Everyone, in a sense, if we get in this condition we become like beggars. Our, our, our hearts want more than they need. One man said, even rich men are beggars because they beg for your attention. They're doing something because they've got everything. All they now need is for everyone to know that they have everything. So everyone, there is nobody that is in a perfect 
state. You're either in want and need or you're abounding and you have more than enough. That's the way life is, up and down. And when, you're, and when you're, you have a lot, then you're happy with God and you're, you're happy with everybody. And when you don't, you're grouchy, you're mean, you know, you're stiff-necked, you're everything. And so you're just the way you're, you wear your sleeve, you wear your feelings on your sleeve. You, you, that's the way, and it shouldn't be so. We ought to learn that we ought to be content, we ought to be temperate, that we ought to look at life the way it really is and help us, amen, and help that word of God have work in our lives so that we can be more like he wants us to be. <clears throat> he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And this applies to what he was talking about before, suffer in need or have too much, not enough. Too much, not enough. Too hot, or too cold. So, we learn how to cope, and the Lord says this is a very important thing in the life of a Christian. It's called moderation. It's called, it's called learning to feel after the Spirit, to see where you are in life according to the will of God. That should be your, it shouldn't be what what you're going to do tomorrow, who you're going to see tomorrow, how you're going to dress tomorrow. It shouldn't be that way. Tomorrow might never come. But it should be one that I have learned to seek after the Lord. He says this. Now, what happened, and the reason he's giving him this lesson is because he has received a gift from these saints. He says, I'm over here doing the work of God and where nobody else met my need, you sent a gift to me, and this I'm praying that this gift abounds unto you because of your giving. See what he said. He taught, listen, I've been over here, and my friends around me, they didn't supply, they didn't help me, but I was fine with it. He said, I know how to live without people giving or, or with people giving. He said, I am, but... He said, I want you to know something very important. He said, now you Philippians know also that at the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So he's saying, all these apostolic churches that, that knew of my mission, he said, they didn't help me. They, none of them. But you alone reached out, and you are going to learn what it is about, about giving and receiving. The only one that understand apparently this principle is you. Notice what he said, of giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. Believing and receiving. Giving and receiving. Believing and receiving. So, you've got to believe first before you receive. And this is what it says here. It says, I'm, you're learning because you already have this basic concept. You are giving or believing in a cause of the gospel and receiving. And he's teaching them that, he said, he's just saying, I'm not talking to you about, uh, about me, you giving to me and receiving. I want you to know what God sees in this. See, I want you to understand what is happening. You are a spiritual church. You're the only church that has done this. You have given first without believing in receiving back. That's what he's teaching. And so many times, church, the church individual, you, you might think that, that, that you're, you're, you're not going, you can't give because you're wondering if you're going to receive back. It, you, you, when you're thinking that way, you're thinking about receiving and giving. Receiving and giving. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You don't receive and then believe. You do the opposite. You do everything that we do, we do by faith. Whatsoever not, is not a faith is sin, the Bible says, or you're missing the mark. You're not understanding. You're not contemplating what it is that, that your, this part of your life, if God, if the Lord gave his only begotten son, notice, he gave something in order to receive a treasure of souls later. In order for you and I to be saved, he gave his son first. 
That's what he did. He gave. God is, God, you, you can't give nothing to God really in a sense of to, to enhance him, but you can give to him what he desires from you, which is a spiritual sacrifice. This is why people can't understand, you know, why do I have to uh, give to God? He has everything. He has all the gold. All the... Because, listen, it's just that you're not a spiritual person and you do not understand what giving and receiving is all about. He told them, listen, you have given to me. You have given first, and you haven't even asked about receiving back. But he said, this is what I want to explain to you. He said, uh, not because I desire a gift, he said, but I desire fruit that might abound to your account. He said, the reason, he said, I am accepting what has been given so that fruit, so that can be added to your account. Let me put it in your term, so your bank account can get big. Yeah. I don't pre preach a prosperity message. I'm telling you the way that it works. Tell you the way it works. He said, to your account, that something would happen in your life because of what you are doing, because you have learned that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Did not Jesus even say that? Am I not giving you a multitude of scriptures, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that you might understand, amen, first of all, that you might not defraud God by not giving, and that you might be blessed because you learn that God is no man's debtor, that to him and to the work of God you put forth and you add something into your account. Add to your account. This is why then the verse of Scripture says, he said, look, I did desire a gift, but Philippians said, but I have everything and I bound. I am full. I received of Aphrodite's uh, the things which were sent, and it says, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So here's Paul. He received the gift. He says, I am full and content. He says, you didn't have to do this, but I am. But guess what? I'm telling you this because you have operated with a, with a sacrifice that God saw to the man of God, to the work of God, and God saw it, and it is what is called a well-pleasing sacrifice. That's like in the old day, an example of you would take a bull and, and your most expensive bull and kill it, and it would burn it, and it would be a sacrifice unto God. It would say that was well-pleasing unto God. The bull was a good bull, expensive. It wasn't a cheap, maimed, messed up, sickly bull. They would get you brought in the best one. And they gave it, and they killed it. They gave, notice, the spirit was in the giving of that to God. Oh, but God, is he gonna, they're just going to kill it, and I'm going to give them a less profitable. No. They gave them, and that was what's called the demonstration of faith. So here he's saying, if you want to know what a sacrifice is to the Lord, it is, comes in. Uh, when he received it, he said, guess what? So that tells me that when you give offerings and you give tithing to God, and you give it to him because it is you gave first. You learn the principle of giving. Of giving. Listen, it's just like it's just like Abraham. Abraham went and he destroyed the enemy, came back with all the all the treasure, and he gave God first. What does that mean? It meant he didn't receive that and say, Oh, look all that I have. Man, I have ten pieces. No, he said, look at what I have in my hands. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give what belongs to God first. He gave first before he received. None of it's his until he gives it away. It, in other words, the first thing he thinks of is what belongs to the work of God. What belongs to God himself. God's going to receive it. The Bible says God receives it when you give it to him. When you pay the tithe and you give the offering, you give it to God. That's because you've understood this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. But with God, that's what it's about. You give, you give that portion to God, and then you take the rest, the other nine pieces, 
then you receive that. That is totally yours. If you, if you keep them all ten together and you don't give God anything, guess what? You're robbing God. Now, robbing God is a personal issue. If I steal from you and you're not looking, it's because you don't even know it's gone. But if I stop you with a gun and say, give me what belongs, it's a personal thing. That's robbing. That's robbery. When you don't pay your tithe, you are robbing God. You are personally robbing God. Amen. It's exactly what's happening. I don't believe that. Well, I don't care. Maybe we're not going to the same place, huh? But where I'm going, where I'm going, I'm not going to say, stick them up, Lord. No, I'd rather stick mine up, you know. I'd rather, I'd rather surrender to God and say, you know, God, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. There is no other way. This, this, there is no other way. And so this is what God has told me to tell you today. He told me to mention to you, simply because I understand we're going into hard times, and some of you are not ready spiritually to receive any miracle from God because you've not given to God what belongs to Him, and you think you're getting by. It's like, for instance, if you, if you don't come to church for three months, and you didn't say your tithe belongs to God, listen to me, I don't know, then that you're, well, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be missing a lot of church off and on. When you don't want to pay tithe, you're not going to be here, or when you don't come, you don't think you have to pay tithe. No, if you live for God, you, you collect what belongs to Him, and you give it to God. That's right. Maybe, Lord, when I'm sick after all these years, maybe I'll, I'll collect it all the other. When I make it, I'll bring it. Well, as long as, it be, as long as you thought to give to God first, I believe you're going to get your healing. Because his ear will be open to you. It becomes a, swell, a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. And so this is what he's talking about. This is, this is what they're doing. They're just sending the, the greatest apostle. They're sending him. Nobody else is taking care of him. And so they're taking care. And they're not, they're not like the other. They're not like the other churches that aren't giving to him. All the other churches, I'm going to tell you what they're thinking. They're thinking this. Well, they're taking care of them. Those other churches have more people. They're sending them something. Uh, and so, well, therefore, I don't need to send them anything because, man, nah, everybody's taking care of it. This other church, they don't care if all the rest of them are giving. They know what they're going to do. They're going to give what God demands, and he, they send him the money, and he tells them, you know what nobody else sent? God bless you. Hey, I'm being blessed and taking care of God knows how to take care of his own. Right. Amen. Amen. He wasn't begging them. Morningstar never begs you to give. He tells you, I tell you what you need to get saved and stay saved. The rest is up to you. But I need to be very clear unto you so that I will be, so I will be blameless in not telling you the whole counsel of God. And therefore, it rests on you whether you're going to be saved or not. I leave it, whether you're going to rob God or not, I leave it in your hands. Amen. Let's clap the hands of the Lord. Let's say, Lord, God. I know everybody here has learned something right there because you understand this, that, that God himself, he doesn't need anything from us. Just obedience. All he, all he wants is obedience. He said, obey my voice. Sacrifices, he says, I will not. I don't want sacrifices, he said. But this one thing, obey my voice. Obey my voice. So here's where you, here's, here's why you are, I'm going to tell you why you're being blessed. I'm going to tell you why you have the things that you have. I'm going to tell you why you're being blessed because you learn how to, when you abound or you don't have, you take care of the things of God. You're already giving. You already aren't, you're not weighing, well, I can afford this or not do, you know, can I do this or not do that? No, you already, your mind is already made up. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He's number one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And everybody else, everybody else, like they thought in that day, all the churches might be sending him, but we're sending anyway. You might be thinking here, well, everybody else is paying tithe, and you know what? I don't need to because everything seems to be in order. Well, you're missing the whole point. You're missing the whole point. God allowed this institution to benefit you, that it would abound toward you. That you would be blessed. That you would be 
not harming yourself by, by, by receiving first and then maybe giving. You see, this is what happened to Israel. I'm going to get to the preaching part. That's the teaching part. This is what happened to Israel. Every seven years, they were supposed to not work, till the ground or anything. And so they were supposed to live by faith and understand that this is the purpose of God. So when they would work six years, they weren't going to work the seventh year, so God would give them twice as much on that sixth year. But here's the problem with Israel. Since they got so much, they didn't think about giving because they received so much. So they refused to give to God what was his, and then they would go to work the next, the next year. Instead of taking the year off, wouldn't there be something if, 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 if this is the way it was today that God said, you know, you work seven years, and you know what, take the next year off, and you're going to get checks in the mail every time. Wouldn't that be nice? Or he would say, or, or better said, it, 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 it worked this way, that you would work six years, and, uh, and the sixth year you got paid twice as much. That's the way it would work, twice as much. And so you have all this money in your bank account, and so instead you're saying, oh, I'm going to take the week off. And I say, no, you know what, I better, I better work, because I don't know if I have so much now. This is the way covetous work. This is how greed works in our lives. You know, we then, you know what, I... I Lord, I'm going to work overtime. So they, what the nation of Israel would do, they, they, would, they never kept that Sabbath. So this is why they were sent into captivity for 400, the Bible says, and the Bible says that the, the time, that they had to wait uh, 700 and, or I'm sorry, 490 years. That God said, this is what's going to happen to you for 490 years. You're going to go into this, this bowl. 70 years captivity, and then he says 70 years are determined. What is all that about? It's being punished because... They were greedy, and they never took the sixth month, the sixth year, and say, okay, we're going to rest this next year. God was exposing how covetous they were. They did not trust God. That's the main thing. They did not obey God. Therefore, the judgment didn't happen like that. Man, it happened after, after many, many years, 400 and some years of doing that to God. He said, all right. It's time to collect. You're going to captivity. And they went into captivity for 70 years. For every time they missed, a year. And so then after that, the Lord said, okay, now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to bring you back. He said, it's going to be all these years, they're going to be added, and then Messiah is going to come. So don't think that because God, the long-suffering God, that, you know, the... Cows and the chickens aren't going to come home to roost someday. They will come. Amen. The judgment will come. It will appear on your door. And you will suffer the consequence. So this is what was happening in that day. This is what they did not, this is what they did not care to understand. They would not hear. They, would be, they were hard-hearted children. Uh, the Bible says they went to captivity. They died in a foreign land. All these things happened to them. And and they were, in, they were in a land where they actually prospered, the captivity. So much to the fact that after those 70 years, they didn't want to go back to Israel. You see, this is why it's so hard to live for God sometimes when you're meddling in the world because you end up liking it too much uh, and you're still prospering and you still have things uh, and you seem to be like everybody else. But listen, you don't have the reward at the end. That's the end. And so the Lord, the great God, the Savior of our soul, He teaches us that this is why, this is why you have to have what is called, for Corinthians put it this way, for if, uh, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what a man hath, and not according to what a man hath not. So there he's saying this. Don't make these grandiose things that you're going to do this for God and that for God when you get, you know, when your ship comes in, when you paint your masterpiece in life and you, then you're going to get things right. No, he said, listen. 
If you have a willing mind, you do it when you have where you're at right now, according to what you have today, not according to what you think you're going to have tomorrow. You see, this is what the way society, this is the way we live our society. We think we're going to have a lot more tomorrow. We think all these things, uh, and, we, and we, we plan on, in fact, you, you'll sign off, and you don't even know how your job is going to be tomorrow, and, and you put yourself out there where you end up in debt because things don't work out the way you thought they should, because you weren't taking, you weren't thinking about the way things are today. You don't pledge, you don't pledge large amounts of money to the church. You pledge according to what you think you're going to have. You pledge only to what you have today, according to what you have today. A willing heart with today is all God wants. All he wants is, is your tithe. All he wants is your offering. All, that's what he wants. And what is happening, he says, see if I will not open the windows of heaven. Why is that? Because first you give, first you give, first you believe, then you receive. That's the way faith operates. That's the way the people of God operate. We started this work not with what, not with what, listen, when we started, when I, we built this church, we didn't have money to build a church like this. We didn't have no money like this. We just, we just built the church with what came in that week. That's it. And so sometimes it was $500 a week. Sometimes it was $1,000 a week. But think about it. In, in, in 54, in 52 weeks of the year, that added up to some money. And then somehow, I can't even explain to you how that God helped us, except that people decided to just on my word do the septic, do stuff that come and plow this ground. None of it. It was going to be like 40000 to to just, just grade this thing, I think it was. And the man came and did it. He said, my friend's going to help. He did it. But he left. He says, it's paid in full. It's paid in full. This was, that, I'm talking about that. <laughs> That's just the groundwork. And so we kept putting, we did everything that we could. Every penny we could, we, I put it toward the church. This, and, and, and so as we went down the road, uh, we get to the end. We're, half, we're not really half done. And then we have to, uh, I decide I'm going to borrow I'm going to borrow money for this. So I went to a man and said, listen, I need a, a loan for five years. A man I've, I've encountered years before, uh, uh, as a Jewish individual that was a sales financier. And uh, so he said, listen, I need this amount of do- money. He says, you don't, I, I can't give you that kind of money, son. He says, he says uh, I said, but I have a building that's a, it's already up, and I have the shell, I have a roof. He said, everybody tells me that. <laughs> everybody tells me that. I said, well, I said, I'd like for you to come and see it. And he said, he said uh, well, he says, well, okay, I'll go and see it then. So he comes down, he sees it, he says, man, you ain't lying. He said, you got that money and more if you want. Whatever it is, you write your, because all he wanted me to do is start building this building, hopefully default, and he'd end up with the building. <laughs> That's a lot of money. I said, to pay back in five years? I said, yeah, okay. I said, okay, but listen, I, if I pay before five years, there's no penalty. He said, I can't do that, man. They'd be mad at me. My brothers and everybody that's going to put into this. He said, no, but that's the only way I, want, I can do it. Just no interest and no penalty if I get it done before that. He says, all right, I'll do that for you, Daniel. So we got the loan, got it going, almost done. And then I had it, we had, I don't even know how we, oh, then here's what happened. I said, no, no banks will own to me. No, no, no banks will, loan, let, will lend to a church back then. Very hard to do. We borrowed, they lent me the money. I paid him off in, in two years. In two years, I paid him off, but I still had the loan over here with a little extra. And so then I, we didn't have enough money for the septic. So we need a septic. We need another thirty, forty thousand for the septic. I said, well, I don't know what to do here. So I, I went and saw the guy over there. Took it. What does it cost to put a, a septic system over here? He told me. 
that's going to be about 30,000 plus. He says, and I said, I need to have that done within three months, four months. He says, uh, all right, we can be done. I said, and can I pay you afterwards? <laughs> he said, I, don't, I, said, I, 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 I said, but you have my word. I'll, I will pay you when it's due. He said, I, I don't know. I, I guess he's run a bunch, of, a bunch of scoundrels, you know. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to go, and I'm going to put that, and, and we'll talk about it after that. So we went, we did it, we put it up, dug it, and somehow, you see, church, just in your giving, we had enough that I had been saving up. I took it to him. I said, okay, here it is. He said, that's awesome. He said, you know what? I didn't, I didn't think you could do it. I didn't think you could do it. I walked away thinking, well, neither could I, but I believe God could. <laughs> I believe God could. Then a man came and said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to, who's going to do all your, your, your fire stuff? I said, well, I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked even, I know I needed it. So he said, well, just in case you need it, don't need it. I'm going to, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you a great price, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I said, by faith, let's do it, man. It's going to be another 30000 I couldn't find another 30000 So he put it, came and put it on. I came day, the day that he finished it. I said, all right, let's settle up. He said, we are. I said, I haven't paid you anything. He said, I'm just doing it for you. And he walked away. I've never seen the fellow again. I said, you know, I, so I just said, thank you, Jesus. I said all that to say this, that... I don't know how your miracle is going to come. And I know that, but I know this, that all I did was follow the precepts that the Bible says, that I have always been a giver. I have always given to the work of God. I have always not only paid my tithe. Uh, so, you know, a lot of ministers say, well, we don't have to pay tithe because we are these. We are, no, we pay tithe. The Pharisees, uh, they all pay tithe. They were officials. And they all pay tithe, all right? So everybody pays tithe. It's like everybody pays taxes. <laughs> Except presidents and kings and, <laughs> and politicians. They don't, have to, they don't have to pay. They don't have to pay. But everybody else pays. And so whatever it is that we are facing in the near future, here's what the essence of this message. The essence of this message is that I believe this that I've been telling you that we are in a very strange time right now. We have, come through the, we have gone through the fall feast, and the Bible says the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we still are not saved. We are still going into another season. But I've told you, this is such a different season. And what makes it so see, different is this is what is called a jubilee year. Now, when I tell you it's a jubilee year, this is, let me tell you what happened in the jubilee year. That the Jubilee year happened on the seventh year, on the 49th year, the last seven. And on that seventh year, they were already not supposed to plant. They were not supposed to grow anything. So they were already one year of faith into, into this year. And then they were supposed to declare a Jubilee year for the next year. And they couldn't plant and they couldn't harvest anything in that year. So the Lord said this. They told themselves, well... Let me read it to you out of the scripture. They said, well, how in the world are we going to survive? They said, how in the world is, is, is this going to happen? Let's see if I can find it real quick. And if ye shall say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Behold, ye shall not sow, neither nor gather the increase. He said, then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and this shall bring forth fruit for three years. So when the Jubilee came, when the Jubilee year came, it would be, he said, you're already not planting this year. When the Jubilee year comes, you're not going to plant that year. So that means you're going three years, but the Bible says, he told him, in the sixth year, I'm going to give you three times the amount. I'm going to give you three times the amount. Now, if we were greedy preachers here, like they are on television, they would say, therefore, you need to dig in your pockets right now 
and you need to give to God like, but that's not what it's about. To us, no. What happened is that you have made up your minds to give to God what belongs to him, so it will become in your store, in your life. So when those years do, when, when this time does come upon you, God's going to answer your prayers. He's going to help your family to be supplied. You are going to have what you need because you've already put it up in store by doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's the way it works. You, you, you believe and you receive. You give and you receive. It is the exact same thing. It, it, work, it is a principle that God works that keeps a man from, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. That is where it works. It's you're already, you're already fully invested in what you're doing. It is your life's work. You're not thinking about that new truck. You're not thinking about anything. You can think about all those things, but when you took care of God first, right. you think about God this week. You took, you took care of His commandment. You gave to God what belonged to His, and then if you can buy 10 trucks, buy 10 trucks. But you have to believe God first. And once you put Him first, I can guarantee you this. You, will, he, you might go through some tough times, but you're not going to become a beggar. Men can lose all that they have. Job did, but he received it all back. You can lose it all in, in different things. It can be the economy. It can be through sickness. It can be through all these things. And people might say, well, maybe he wasn't doing what God wanted him to do. Don't worry about what people say. It's what you know. It's what you've done. It's what you've experienced. It's what you have believed in. And you can rest assured. Hey, don't make fun of me. Uh, I might have fallen. I might be down and out. Uh, and I might be down for seven years. But I will arise and I will get back up. Uh, and I will do what the will of God. Because I've already done the will of God back then. I've already sacrificed to God back then. Therefore, I trust that God will take care of me. Therefore, if you have this kind of faith, you need to know this. Regardless of what comes in the future, you can stand firm that God will take care of you, that he will watch after you, that you have kept his precepts, that you have believed his word and his name. Therefore, stand upon the rock and trust God. Nobody can do it for you. You've got to do it for yourself. You've got to stand up for yourself and say, no, the devil, he's not going to rip me off anymore. I'm not going to obey the devil anymore. I am going to trust and believe God. And as I believe God, he's going to manifest himself. Some of you will experience what it's called. The Lord pressed down, shaking together and running over. Shall man give into your bosom? That's what happened to me when I built this church. Men gave into my bosom. You didn't go and ask for it. I didn't ask you for it. It just came. Yeah. All you did was give tithe and offering, tithe and offering. And God blessed you with a place to live in. A place to raise your children in. He gave you, amen, the things that are necessary for our future. That's what we're preparing for right now. We're preparing today. As of this day, you're preparing for the rest of your life. You are depending on God for the rest of your future, and he will not let you down. Well, stand with me tonight. I won't. You won't be going from God to house. You won't be going from church to church asking for a handout. My God shall supply your need. Maybe you haven't had a miracle in a long time. Listen, the future tells me that you're going to need miracles in the near future. And what you're doing now is you are believing right now. You're not worried about receiving because God is already, you're already content. 
If you learn to be content where you're at and you quit throwing money at, the, at everything that you see, listen, if you learn to be content, number one, you will always put God first because that's part of God's word, be content. Yeah. You ever hear about, I think there's a lot of wealthy people out there that they, they learn to do this, they're content, or maybe they're super stingy, I don't know, but they seem to be content because they have, they're, they're millionaires, but they don't dress like millionaires. We're poor as Joe's turkey, and we dress like millionaires. <laughs> you notice that? We dress better than millionaires because we want to have people think good about us. A millionaire doesn't care. He already got his pockets full. He, he, he don't care. He don't even care if he brushes his teeth that morning. He, 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 could, <laughs> he just got to do what he wants to do. He, and you know what? He's going to have money answered all things, the Bible says except entrance into the kingdom. Therefore, it's very hard for a rich man to enter into the, into the kingdom. But you and I, when we learn to be content with what we have, you might put the brakes on that stuff, and you might, your bank account might be settling up where it should be. We have built, we have built Starbucks. Think about it. Eight dollars a cup. Well, if you pay your tithe and everything, you want to do that? Hey, drink all the coffee you want. I don't care. But isn't it amazing that we'll drink a cup of, of, of Starbucks and then we'll go and we'll say, oh man, I, I don't want to pay four fifty for a dozen eggs. Six dollars for a pound of bacon. I don't want to do that. So you walk away. You want to starve, but you can drink your coffee. <laughs> See how you are? It's the truth. Our values are all messed up. They're all jack-legged, you know? Oh, stink. But when you really start to think about it, I'm not saying don't drink coffee. I'm just saying, hey, you'll be more understanding that, you know, don't let your kids go without bacon because you got to have your coffee. Bring home the bacon. Oh, let's lift our hearts where we're at right now. Master, we're thankful today. We are thankful today that you are helping us to get ready for that great day. We are not part-time Christians, Lord God. The only way things are going to get better in financial in some of these lives here is because they've got to simply put you first, to give and then receive, to give what belongs to God and then give to that what belongs to Caesar in a separate. But you first, Lord, you first. And if we learn that, to put and trust you first, you are going to renovate, you're going to bless, you're going to help your children, you're going to minister, you're going to keep us in the trying time that is about to come and hit this world. Lord, let your children be ready. Let, let their hearts be open. Lord, let their, let their hearts saturate with your word. Lord, not to receive, not to have anything mentioned on receive, but Lord, in giving. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I'd like to open this platform. I'd like to invite you to come and meditate and, and thank God for a word that is going to get us people ready for the trying times to come.